Installing a universal carburetor on your hot rod or muscle truck or whatever you're working on is really a fun thing to do. But there are six common mistakes that I see people make over and over and over when doing these that will kind of cover them today, kind of help you avoid those pitfalls. Let's go. We're going to cover these in really no particular order, but there are some that are far more important than others, but I guess you'll kind of have to determine that on your own. But there are, there's probably more than six, but these are the ones that I kind of see over and over and over again of really common mistakes that people make. And I think maybe just some of it is just not thinking through it and just isolating well, I'm, today I'm going to work on a carburetor and that's all I'm going to consider or little details that may have not been important in the past. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We'll talk about the first one right now. One of the biggest ones I see, and it's so common, and I'm sure you've seen it too. You pull into a car show somewhere and, you know, guys have been out driving for a little while to get to a to a, an event somewhere or maybe it's a a really cool deal like a you know a power tour where you get to drive quite a bit during the day and kind of car show-ish every night in a different town but every single time you go to an event where there's a lot of people at somebody's going to pop the hood and start monkeying around with idle mixture screws it is the most, seems like the most misunderstood thing about what idle mixture screws actually do. It should be pretty simple. Idle mixture <laughs> screws. They don't control anything at wide open throttle. You're not going to affect anything in the cruise mode or the power mode. Now, when you're coming off idle, there are some things that may you may work through, but unless every single person is having off idle hesitation issues and it's generally not a mixture screw issue it's a transfer slot issue so it's kind of comical sometimes to see it and i do get a lot of questions about it and i don't uh, necessarily want to make anyone feel bad about it but i always try to sometimes i answer that question with a question what do you think the idle mixture settings are doing that is affecting the problem that they articulated and sometimes it's just like just not knowing and that's completely okay i i learn something new on a carburetor every time i work on it or every time i do something new and different or try a different combination of parts and all that so uh, it's completely understood but monkeying around with mixture screws is just not something that uh, you have to spend hours and hours and hours on um, once you get it set and once you get the carburetor cruising and running well, it's usually okay for the duration of the, the service of that, that situation that you put the carburetor in. Now, if you make changes, uh, something very simple like just timing, ignition timing can drastically and typically does always change uh, ignition or excuse me, the uh, idle uh, speed for sure and uh, sometimes you can you know correct you'll have to correct the speed but uh, idle mixture kind of comes right into play with that so if you're if you're having an issue with a carburetor and you're not quite sure of it those basic adjustments are okay in initial setup but farting around with my idle mixture screws constantly isn't really getting you anywhere it's just frustrating even more because it's not curing the problems that you're having I've got another video on this coming soon, but it's uh, the second one is not choosing the right style or type of carburetor for the application you're working on. Now, what do I mean when I say that? I understand uh, because certain folks are very, very well tuned or understand how something works really well and they will only stick to that type of carburetor whether they grew up on an AFB style carburetor, they grew up on a, a Holly style carburetor, and they just assume that that is the only carburetor for every application. And it's clearly not. The reason why there are so many different options in the market is, one, everyone's got their own little style, uh, for sure, when you look at things that are you know, very common on the uh, on the OE side, like a Quadrajet or a Thermoquad or some of the Ford uh, uh, carburetors and how they were designed out of the factory. But when you're just considering an aftermarket carburetor purchase, there are a lot of different options for you. And it just really depends on what you're asking the engine to do. Sometimes in a very high performance application, you need something that 
is going to deliver an excessive amount of fuel to help protect the engine and deliver the power that it needs um, and give it the fueling that it needs. The GMC truck is a really great example. It is primarily a cruiser. Now, yes, of course, occasionally we'll do some burnouts with it and all that and have fun, but that truck is really lives its life well under 5,000 RPM. I don't have it there very often. In a cruiser style carburetor like uh, the Edelbrock uh, AVS2, sometimes with the vacuum secondaries, 4160 style Holley carburetors are really, really good, but it's just comes down to a little bit of preference on that way. Some guys are very used to using the Holley carburetor and some folks are just very comfortable using uh, the Edelbrock style carburetor, but pull, putting a full race style carburetor on an engine that is just not needing that level of performance, sometimes it's a waste, but two, sometimes you'll end up fighting it with overfueling and trying to get it adjusted correctly, especially if you're looking for even a, the slightest bit more economy in it. Now, again, the GMC truck is a great example. It's got an overdrive transmission, so I can cruise it down the highway no problem at 70 miles per hour and 2100 RPM, 2200 RPM ish. Um, there's no reason to put that style of, of carburetor on there. It doesn't need it. Doesn't need uh, the complexity of it, and it certainly doesn't need all that extra fuel. So running a carburetor that's got a little bit better uh, uh, fuel delivery and throttle response is, is a way better carburetor choice. The third one being electric choke. Now this one will catch some folks off guard a little bit because I don't think they really give too much thought to it. Completely understood. Once it's operating correctly, there's really no reason to go back to it unless you're at different times of the year and the engine doesn't need near as much choke. Right now we're in the mid 90s here in the mid south and it's summertime weather and uh, I run a manual choke carburetor on my engine anyway, but if I run uh, an electric choke carburetor, I typically dial that back. The engine doesn't need near as much choke when the ambient temperature is warmer. The engine starts at a warmer condition than it would be during the winter months. But I, it's very common to see that where, you know, the, the performance of the engine is suffering or things like the fast idle cam don't engage or, or disengage correctly. Uh, the choke is set improperly. Certainly the biggest common mistake with electric chokes is wiring it incorrectly. And I know folks will argue about this in the comments. I completely understand it, but you need a good, clean 12 volt source that is constant 12 volts, not something that drops down, like grafting into an ignition coil, like going to the alternator, bad decisions on an aftermarket style carburetor. Now, for sure, on a factory carburetor, sometimes you can see that differently. We're only talking about an aftermarket style carburetor. These all need a good, clean 12 volt source. So just either tap back into a uh, windshield wiper circuit if you want to leave it under hood. A lot of folks will go right back to the uh, fuse panel and take a, a tab right off there and, and, and use a, a full clean key on 12 volt out of there. That's what I do on the GMC truck when I'm running an electric choke. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it, it seems less complicated than it should be, but I run into a lot of problems constantly uh, with folks who say and having, having problems with their performance of the engine, and sometimes we trace that back to the electric choke not being set properly, incorrectly wired. <laughs> One that uh, is almost on my top of my pet peeve list, list is folks that say, well, I bought this carburetor, I bolted it on, it was great right out of the box. There is no such thing on a universal carburetor that it knows what it's going on right out of the box. Now, if you have a really common application uh, where you're a 350 cubic inch, very mild camshaft, very mild uh, other uh, components are with it, a dual plane intake, maybe a smaller header, whatever the case may be, maybe no other internal uh, you know, changes on compression ratio, no cylinder head changes, you're fairly stock other than just a little bit, then yes, it's usually generally pretty close because those carburetors from the factory are generally set that way because they know they can get away with it. Yes, it can go on a 327 or a 289 possibly, and it may be a little richer, it may be a little bit more complicated for it to deliver fuel, but it's generally close enough to get the thing running, driving and all that. But on a universal carburetor, they must be tuned.
the good news is too is typically uh, those style of common car carburetors that you can get over the counter like an O'Reilly or a Zone or Advance one of those they will typically sometimes have a little bit of the tuning stuff available there as well I know O'Reilly's is usually pretty good about having you know some rods and jets uh, I don't know if they carry any calibration kits for uh, the Edelbrock carburetors but certainly those are all fairly easy to get from uh, uh, your favorite retailer or e-tailer uh, to your house in a day or two. The Edelbrock carburetor obviously is pretty phenomenal in having an actual tuning chart to help you uh, make those decisions. So if you're trying to go a little bit richer, a little bit leaner, uh, in a power mode, cruise mode, it tells you exactly the direction to go in a very easy to read chart. It's one of the things that the Edelbrock uh, folks are absolutely industry leaders in is helping you tune that carburetor. It's not too complicated to do it on your own, certainly on a, a 4150 or a 4160 style carburetor. It's it's a little hit or miss if you're using an AFR gauge. Sure, it makes it a lot better, a lot quicker, a lot easier, but they're generally pretty simple and usually, you know, see to the pants a little bit of uh, uh, spark plug reading. You can kind of get it a little close. Certainly on AFR, it goes a lot quicker, but just from the get-go, from the jump, as soon as you put a universal carburetor on an engine, plan on making the tuning adjustments to fit your specific application. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's pretty common out there as far as combinations goes, but it's very, very difficult to find a carburetor right out of the box that works really, really well. They can be close sometimes, but generally I will tell you they're wildly off and you have to do a lot of basic uh, tuning adjustments with idle mixture, idle speed, uh, and making sure you get the electric choke set right, and then all of the internal stuff uh, getting the rods, the jets, the power valves all set correctly for your application is hugely critical and a big mistake I see all the time people making. The next one is, is something that's pretty common. If you've ever asked me a carburetor related question of an issue that you're having, almost universally one of the very first questions I ask you is what your ignition timing is set to. And I get a lot of well, yeah, it's set correctly, but I'm having this problem with the carburetor. That's where I really need the help. Timing cures a lot of problems that folks have with carburetors, and ignoring it certainly makes that process of tuning that carburetor far more difficult, far more challenging. Timing cures a lot of the sins that are occurring with today's really poor gasoline, with ethanol added gasoline, with just a little bit more time that's needed to burn that fuel and air mixture. Also too, things have improved a little bit. Now when you look at modern uh, factory, you know, engines like the LS, the Coyote, uh, the Gen 3 Hemi, generally those folks are, are those engines always run quite a bit more timing. Different application, completely understood, but even if you took an LS engine and committed a mortal sin by putting a carbureted intake on it uh, and running a carburetor, you're going to need quite a bit more timing to get that thing to run properly. It is one of the biggest things that correct almost all of the problems uh, that I get a lot of questions on. And if, you, if you're running, uh, I'm down closer towards sea level. We've talked about this a thousand times, it seems like. But it's certainly a very important part of what we're doing here. Uh, at sea level, I always start uh, 12 to 14 degrees before top dead center. The higher I go uh, in elevation, that changes. I will add more timing. You have less air, so you need to lean the carburetor out, add more timing, and certainly anything with a more aggressive uh, cam profile, engine profile. Now, the GMC truck is a really good example of that. I, it's currently set at 16. It seems to be where it likes it the most. It's hot starts really well, cold starts well, power is very good, but I've had that engine up to 20 on initial uh, set fairly fairly frequently. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to do that when I'm kind of testing through things when we do carburetor tests and different configurations just to see if a little bit more timing is going to help out the, the way the carburetor runs. So please always consider those two things linked and tuned together. If you're going to make carburetor and tuning adjustments, just know that working with ignition timing goes hand in hand with it and you must do the two together. If one's right and the other one's not quite right, you're never going to get the two to talk together well, perform well in the engine, and you've got to spend that time 
working with the ignition first and then you can start playing around with the carburetor but it's the it's probably i said it wasn't going to rank these but this one's probably number one it cures a lot of evils the last one might see a little funky but it really is a common mistake that i see and that is not running an air cleaner gasket always always run an air cleaner gasket i keep hundreds of these around here i certainly use them on everything i run whether it's going to be on the chevelle with a performance style carburetor whether it's on my gmc on a, on a cruiser always run the air cleaner gasket reason being is noise obviously the other is sealing the the uh, air cleaner to the you know the uh, carburetor to keep it clean keep clean air forcing the air to go through the filter and not being sucked through there there's a dozen good reasons why you should use one, but always use an air cleaner gasket. Sometimes when in some of my tuning videos, you'll see it on the carburetor. And if I'm zinging the throttle at all, sitting in, uh, uh, sitting underneath the hood, checking something, the air cleaner gasket will go flying off there. But keep, use them. Don't, don't throw it away or just go, well, the air cleaner fits on there fine with that. I don't, I don't need, know why I would even use it. Run the air cleaner gasket. Again, very common mistake that people make. And I think it's just... Uh, maybe it's just not understanding why they need it or just not having one. So there you have it. Six things that are, are pretty common mistakes that people make. And their good news is, is they're all very correctable. They're all easy to, to take care of. It's just understanding and spending the time to do it, ensuring that you got the right ignition timing. Make sure you're running the gasket. Tune that carburetor when it's coming out of the box. It's not perfect no matter what you know your buddy on the internet says. Spend the time to tune it. You'll get way more out of the engine and see the full potential of whatever you're working on and all of the other little details we talked about. Those are certainly some of the most critical ones. Now, stuff I left out today is certainly, you know, we talked about ignition system, but fuel system setup is very important as well. Uh, I'll always run a pressure regulator on a carburetor, but, you know, we've talked about that endlessly, and it seems like hopefully people are getting a little bit more in tune to it, but I, I certainly get that one very commonly. So you can call that 6A is run a pressure regulator. So if you got any questions or you're experiencing any carburetor problems you want to talk about, leave them in the comments down below. I'm always happy to do that, help you work through some things and give you some ideas of some things to try and some things that you may not have thought about. But uh, yeah, carburetors are not complicated. They're certainly much easier. Things like YouTube and Google and all that, and I guess even AI to that extent, have helped make it a little bit easier for folks to go out there and find the answers that they're looking for. So hopefully some of that helped you today. Uh, and hopefully it'll help you get you on the right path to uh, not making the same mistakes that uh, some people do that uh, really put them in a hurt when they're trying to tune and uh, get a good running engine and a good running carburetor. We'll catch you guys on the next one. We'll see you.